For tonight, our guest is Tad o Oviet, Oviet yes. with Park ENT Cycles. So, um, without further ado, um, I want to take, be respectful of everyone's time. We're going to jump in and have uh, t Tad tell us a little bit about his company. We're going to start with a video. Yeah, I'll show you a video of the actual product working because. Being a new product is actually kind of hard for people to understand what it looks like, how it works and everything. We like to say that it hugs your bike, uh, but sometimes that doesn't quite get across what it is. So I have a short video here that I'm gonna play on a bit of a loop. And what it is, is one of the demos we did where it actually has the unit out in public and this person has put his bicycle into it. He's checked the spokes for clearance, mainly because when he activates it using a key card, which you can also use a cell phone, it puts a metal bar through the actual spokes of the wheel. And as he's activated, the arms that come down, you know, you see as he pushes it through there, it kind of gates open so you can push the bicycle in. Well, there are bars actually in the arms that come down and stop that gated motion from happening to form a nice solid L. And that way it actually forms a metal bar through the frame of the bicycle. So it locks not only the wheel, but the frame of the bicycle as well. And that's key for anybody riding around on a bicycle. You want to lock up everything when you get there. So, I mean, normally you have one of these type of locks. Everybody has them, everybody's known about them, and they're really great. But the problem is, is that they're super easy to break through and tear apart and everything. This one took me about 20 seconds with a Sawzall. Uh, most, it just shows that the bike lock industry has not kept up with the power tool industry. And I can go down to Ace Hardware, I can go down to anywhere and just go ahead and pick up a power tool, bring it out, battery powered even, and tear, tear these things apart. Now, people are like, well, this is a, you know, steel cable, big deal. You can easily take through one of these things. I also have one of the top of the line U-locks. This one took about 20 seconds to go through with a Sawzall. Now people are wondering, you know, well that's, but it's got the hardened steel on it, you know, there's no reason I should be able to break through this. It's like, well, this part here may be hardened, but that's just regular steel on this stuff. So you can saw through these things, no problem. And it's gotten to the point now where thieves have even started sawing through the bike racks themselves and then taping them up afterwards just because they know people will lock to it. So they'll just tear apart the bike rack. Right, well I think you made a really great point is that I don't think that the bike lock industry has kept up with the power um, tool industry or the expensive nature of the bikes. I mean, because the, yeah. the bikes themselves are not, they're, they're like oh, instruments yeah. now. They're not, they're not like they used to be. They're not like your dad's swing. You know, you can get bikes that are graphite. You could easily spend a thousand bucks. And uh, as I mentioned to Tab, my, uh, my oldest son is in uh, college now, and I think okay. the lowest bike that you can get is like 400 bucks. Every, and that's like maybe two or three bikes out of the selection of several hundred, and the rest of them are seven, eight hundred. Those yeah. are Walmart bikes. Those are Walmart bikes. Exactly. They range exactly. from the $400 bicycle you do get at Walmart all the way up to $7,000 no right. easily. Some parts alone that I found out recently, some parts alone are worth $4,000 a piece. And those are the gears, the shafts and everything. And it's a situation where the bike lock industry has not, because the bike racks don't lock up your bikes. The bike locks rack up your, lock up your bikes. But it hasn't progressed past the horse and hitch days. Right. It's been that same way for millennia. It hasn't changed really at all. Right. So with this product, we're putting it out there saying, now we need to have infrastructure out there that'll actually secure your property. Because even in parking lots, they'll say, don't leave valuable property inside your cars because your cars lock up. Right. But the bicycle is your valuable property. And to a lot of people, it's their mode of transportation. So now they're having to trust their mode of transportation to a thin piece of metal twine or you know braided cable or something. And it's just one where if we can make gated enclosures so cars can't leave, if we can make other situations where vehicles will stay safe. Why don't we make an infrastructure so that bicycles as well can stay safe? And it's a hard thing to do because of the nature of a bicycle itself. It's an entirely custom market. Agreed. I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's really interesting to have you here because you, the way you're describing the challenge that your product addresses really kind of gets to the heart of the startup value proposition. 
you know, you, uh, in a lot of instances when you talk about the way uh, design, the design process, you almost want to start with the problem you're going to solve in order to actually have a successful uh, product development uh, cycle. And as you describe this, I mean, there's clearly several gaps here um, in terms of the lock suppliers, the oh, quality yeah. of the bike, because again, you mentioned the bike has turned into this component and each of the elements associated, the wheels cost a couple of hundred, oh, yeah. the gears. Easy. So now, what were some of the challenges? I mean, how did you arrive at this okay. place? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, because that, that's an issue, as you described, it doesn't sound like your pitch has been one that came, it sounds like you learned yeah. as you were making your pitch. Yeah. So could you tell us a little this, bit about the evolution of the parking and team? Sure. Sure thing, Michael. Um, this was the old college project, you know, and it was a friend of mine in college, uh, Georgia Southern University. He had two bicycles stolen in a week. And this guy had like thousand dollar road bikes. First time he had the U-lock, the second time he was only able to get the chain. But the kicker is, is that when the second one was stolen, the bike thefts being brazen that they were like, holy crap, this guy keeps putting bicycles out there, left a sticky note on the cut bike lock chain with a smiley face and thanks written on it. Just because they're like, this is the second one, why would he keep doing this? And I was just, I wanted to help out a friend. Right. So back in the college days, and I, I was coming up on senior design and I needed a project to be able to do, so I'm like, I'll take this on, we'll see what happens. Okay. And then it was one of those where it, grew in that situation where I took things home, built processes, and I was still in the college experience, still in the college mindset. So for me, it was just a project. Okay. It was just something to do. But it, in the same situation, it actually ended up paying for two master's degrees for me. Is that right? Yeah, well, I, I studied first uh, computer engineering at Georgia Tech. Okay. And then I uh, got an electrical engineering degree from Georgia Southern. Okay. And it was during that that I kind of thought of this idea. And then they started two master's courses and wanted these senior design, these senior graduating engineers to stay on for masters. So I was like, hey, you know, I'll do that. And can I just keep working on my project? Cause I've already got some work done on it. And they're like, sure, no problem. We'll pay for your tuition just because you're the inaugural class. And I was wow. like, okay, anytime somebody can pay for your master's degree, do it. And wow, that's a great, uh, pretty fortuitous timing. And it was only at the end of that first master's degree that I actually was in con uh, contact with the uh, MBA professor who was the entrepreneurship professor and said, you know, we really like what you're doing. We want you to keep working on it. You know, we don't want you to stay on for an MBA and I'm making my graduate assistant. Wow. Uh, my thing, get it in, I, I need that in writing. <laughs> like immediately, I need that in writing. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so then I went on, did my MBA and I built out the business because I, I'm, I was an engineer. I didn't know practically anything still about business. Still are an engineer, yeah. but did, I mean, I didn't know anything about business, and I was just like, you know, sure, whatever. You know, you're gonna pay for it, fine. And then I did what every college, a lot of college graduates do, and they just, they get out and they work. Right. Yeah, worked at a, worked at a big corporation, contract worker, programming, and that's when I got a phone call on the ride home that said, don't come into work tomorrow. You're out, you're done. We downsized, basically, you know. Wow. And I was like, well, darn, what do I do now? And that's when this whole idea of bike renting showed up. Okay. And I was like, well, that thing I did in college, that would work with that too. So let's... So when you say bike renting, it's similar to like the zip car. It's similar, a yeah. The subscription kind of service where you have the bikes. Because I know in Chicago, my hometown, down by the lakefront, they have racks of bikes that... Yeah, um, that was, it was when that was first getting started. coming and getting started. And I, and I was seeing how much it was taking off. And I was like, wow, that's actually something. Maybe I can do something there. And that's when I decided to kind of say, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go in on this and see how, how far I can go, because I didn't know at that point in time. First thing I had to do was to sell my father on it. Okay. And he's a salesman, has been for 30 years, so selling him on this idea was quite difficult. Okay. But realizing that at some point down the line, I'm gonna have to sell to universities, municipalities, all that kind of stuff, might help to have somebody who's done that stuff before. Absolutely. And then I reached out into the Atlanta area and saying, what, what can I do to learn about entrepreneurism and stuff? What can I do to figure out what I'm gonna do? And that's when I came across the Advanced Technology Development Center, the ATDC, and went through their courses and everything and trying to figure out what to do. And through contacts in there, was able to find out about something called the Caps, Georgia Tech Capstone Design Program, right. which is $8,000 and you get five engineers to work on your project. Which and you've is, won. I mean, you're like you've won. I mean, I've seen you, you the, your product, 
and your process. Yeah. You've won a couple of these contests. You've, you know, you've participated in a lot of pitch programs. Yeah. I mean, what was that whole, how, what was that like? It was one of those situations where uh, you basically get put in front of a room of people. Suddenly you have to do something. And at the same point in time, you're going back to, you're talking to serial entrepreneurs. You're talking to people who have done it before and saying, when I get put in front of a group of people, how, what do I do? You know, who, who do I talk to? How right. do I get that? How do I get the right words to say? Because my pitch, which uh, from people from the Alpharetta ATDC circle can totally back this up. My pitch originally was probably one of the worst pitches, the worst things you ever heard in your life. I got this thing that locks bikes up with stuff. Right, well, you know, I mean, I mean, you know just, the startup market has been glamorized. Yeah. So people think it's kind of like, you know, everything is gonna be like Facebook. Oh yeah, yeah, people. totally. And it's really not, that's why your perspective on, cause it sounds like you've had an iterative yeah. approach to this whole process. It's, it's, a learn, it's a learning curve. It's a steep learning curve, especially if you actually want to do anything with it. Um, and it, it's pract you know, practice makes perfect, that kind of stuff. And then practice shows you where your flaws are. Okay. And you gotta be able, you gotta, the biggest thing is you gotta be open to learn through everything, through the good times, through the bad. They say there's a catchphrase out there, fail fast, fail early. I don't like that. Okay. Because that just says you're giving up, you, you know, all that kind of stuff. I say, if you're gonna fail fast, learn from it. Right. Learn whatever mistake you made, keep doing what you're doing. Maybe, maybe use a pivot here or there. If you haven't pivoted at least five times in a month or something like that when you're first starting off, you know, maybe you're stuck in your ways about something. And, well, I mean, what I noticed as I was uh, preparing for the interview is that you really have stayed with your project. Yes. Yeah. And so you've demonstrated at least one of the things that you hear about among about entrepreneurship, which is that you got to believe in the problem that you're trying to solve. So, you know, you're you stay true to the whole bicycle concept. Yeah. Is that because you is it like because it's your baby or do you really see um, the in game associated because it seems like yeah. you're close now. Yeah. Um at first, it was my baby type thing, um, but that actually ended pretty quick, pretty early. Um, my baby, it was ugly. It was <laughs> butt ugly. Um, and that's even before I did um, the capstone things. That, okay. that was my baby time. And it was then where I could kind of see, you know, what the possibilities would be, but I knew I didn't have the, I mean, I'm a computer electrical engineer. I don't know, I don't know steel. I don't know right. welding, I don't know any of that kind of stuff. Right. So it was one of those, how do I find the people to let me get to that point? And it was other things that I've had four, I had already had four years of research on it. And it's in that four years of research, I actually found truth points. Yeah. Things that I can't, even as an engineer, as a scientist, I can't argue with. And when you find stuff like that, you're like, okay, there's something here, there's something I can build off of. And by using that as a core, and saying, okay, this is not gonna end up the way I thought it would be. Right, and I mean, these are pivotal points that you're bringing, I mean, it's like you've prepared, you're coming to milestones that a lot of people, it's not like you took something easy. No. <laughs> no. And you are learning from each iteration yes. of product. How, how many iterations would you say that this, your, your device has gone through since you started? I think we're on seven or eight now. Um, Is that right? Seven or eight of the actual physical design. Um, I think we're on 30 when it comes to the business process of it. So the idea originally was going to be okay, we'll put these out, we'll put bicycles in it, they'll share the bicycles, it'll be great, it'll be wonderful. And then somebody's like, hey, what happens if someone gets hit on the bicycle that you're renting out to them? You know, liability. So we're like, okay, we got to go sit down with a liability lawyer. Then after sitting down a liability lawyer, I'm, I'm shaking in my, I'm, I'm like, oh dear Lord, you know, n none of that. Only in America. Only, n <laughs> none of that, you know, we're just gonna go and go, that's when you pivot, you, you change. We actually ended up going backwards to our core of saying, what is this? This is a bike security system. Right. Um, okay, great, it's a bike security system. Can it be used for renting? Can it be used for bike share? Can it be used for all that? Totally, it can definitely be used for all of that but we're not gonna be the one who's gonna be facilitating, we're gonna facilitate the rack itself right. because that's what our core competency is right. in this area. And that's how we're going to build this out. And once we did that, a lot of things started falling in place of being like, okay, well, if we have the rack, you know, 
what's the scalability on that? You know, okay, and then you take a look around, you look at all the bike racks around, and you're like, okay, who's the number one distributor of bike racks? Right. You find out that uh, there's this group out of Minnesota that's the number one facilitator of bike racks. You find out also that it's a billion dollar market. Right. And you're like, okay, I was looking at bike renting market. Turns out bike parking market, bike security market is so much bigger. Right. And by 10, 10 hundred fold. And you're like, oh, that's great, you know? And I think what I find fascinating is that all of the things that you're talking about, this isn't like software. This isn't, no. the, this isn't the sexy, you know, <laughs> stuff they're talking about, you know, in all the startup magazines. This is a piece of steel molded, yeah. but it, you've really done something interesting in terms of how you've incorporated technology yeah. into a hardened design. Yeah, device. I mean, most all of our IP is involved in the hardware of it, but we realize that with the growing economy, everybody has smartphones, everybody wants to do stuff, everybody wants to be connected and grab data. Well, how do you do that with this? It's like, we were thinking, oh, kiosk, you know, everything's gonna be piped through a kiosk and it's gonna come back. I was doing, a, you were saying I was been in competitions, I was in the tag business launch competition, right. and that's when they were like, well, why can't I just use my phone? I just want to use my phone and tap it and make it go and make it do stuff. And I'm like, you can do that now? You know, I, I didn't know at that point. Wow. So that's when I started looking into it and the guy's like, well, use a Raspberry Pi. And I'm like, you like a Pi? Like a, you eat? I, I didn't quite understand. So using my technical background, I went back in and found out all about this, the technology that's coming out, Raspberry Pis, Bluetooth, um, RFID readers, all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is even better now because technology is advancing to the point now that we can just, we can actually implement this and it's actually gonna help us to be more scalable, more everything. And it was, it was a lot of time spent on chat rooms, a lot of time looking through other people's code, trying to see what worked, what didn't work. Right. I total, I took over half my father's garage. Um, okay. I took over a quarter of his basement to be my electronics lab, okay. which there were many nights where he would just sit there and yell down, are you going to sleep? And I'm like, yeah, later, whatever, you know, like that. So he'd be like, all right, just bye. And then it would come down to, okay, we, we got this part working. We got that part working. And the best thing I can say is to be honest about where you are. We've been to universities before um, and we did not have the whole thing working. And we were very honest about, listen, we don't have this part working, but this is where we are, can you help us out? And they're like, well, you know, when you come back, come back when you have something more. Well, about three months ago, we actually got the full thing working with RFID, with Bluetooth. Um, haven't done solar yet, but that's a whole nother category. <laughs> not even going there yet, but it's, there are possibilities there. Absolutely. Um, and so we're in the process now of going back around, but the software stuff, that took maybe six months. In the whole last four years that I've been building this out from a college project to the green monster, as we call it now, mm -hmm. um, that was all hardware development and everything. The last six months has really been software. Um, and so all of this started to take place as the belt line, I mean, yeah. chronologically, the belt line was happening in parallel. Definitely. As you were going through this, so it's almost like serendipity. I'm like, yeah. as the belt line comes along, you're coming up with really something that those businesses that would be a part yeah. of the belt line would need. I mean, even in your example, um, I don't know where that is, but it looks like that's uh, over uh, General Assembly or over. That's at, uh, actually uh, in Midtown. That's uh, right behind the Synergy Building uh, okay. in a place called the Garage that just opened up recently in uh, in Midtown. Okay. And they were thankful enough to allow us to demonstrate this while, right. during one of their um, during one of their uh, openings. Okay. So and uh, really great people. Love it. You ever get a chance to go to go right. check it out? There's uh, along with a lot of other entrepreneurship spots that have been popping up around Atlanta. Uh, the Gathering Spot as well. Um, right. ATDC's whole remodeling that they've done in there. And now uh, with ATV, WeWork, Rome spreading out all over. There's, there's all these other places that are building up, right. and it's great because that means that more entrepreneurs are talking to other entrepreneurs. And the best thing I can say to other entrepreneurs who are thinking about working on a project or something, get out of your house, go talk to somebody. I would not be where I am if I had not gotten out and gotten to talk to people. The, the whole reason we have uh, commercial product design is because I literally ran into somebody in the hallway. I was walking through this energy building, I came around the corner, bumped right into her, and we started talking and she's like, oh, I, I know about this 
Georgia MEP, which is a manufacturing extension partnership program, which is government subsidized product design. And I was like, what, what do you mean by that? You know, is, is, is this good? Is this bad? I, I didn't know at that point. She's like, well, it's great because you don't have to spend so much to get your product designed and made right. or just designed out. You just go with these people and they'll, it's much lower cost. I'm like, well, that's great. And then talking to another startup in the area as well, I found about a manufacturer locally, which a lot of people say, go to China, go to India, go, but if you're in the development process of building something out, you gotta be there with the manufacturer step-by-step -step process and work with them. Yeah, so some of those markets are dangerous for the knockoff cable. They, they are, we, we especially cannot, we, we can't go to China yet. Um, it's one of those where bike theft is crazy in China. So, agreed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a perfect mixture to, for... Although we have been approached, yeah, although we have been approached many times by right. Chinese manufacturing liaison, we've had to politely say, no thank you. Right. Um, but, and that I can actually say now that we're, we're patented and everything now too, so that's... So that's the question I have. So is something like this, is it a patent or a copyright? I mean, how do you do... Are, do you, yeah. you mentioned a couple of times that your IP is in the hardware design. So you've patented your approach? Yeah, we've patented our approach on this and it's a real question you gotta have as an entrepreneur. Do I even patent? Do I go down that route or do I just copyright? Or do I not tell anybody? Coca-Cola, great example, never patented. Never wants to be patented. Doesn't need to be patented. Other things like the Swiffer wetjet, crazy thing. Don't, it's the, the original one was the pad and the stick and you kind of push the pad around. That's pat every other thing you see on one of those Swiffer wet jet things is its own individual patent surrounding that original stick and pad. Found that out on IP, it was crazy, but it's one of those where you gotta really weigh if you want to or, if you want to or not or if you need to or not. Right. With ours, with the structural design and it being steel and it being out in the public, we realized that at some point somebody's gonna walk up with a tape measure and figure some stuff out. So, you know, we, we actually have to patent it. And I, I tell you, it came down to one claim. We had 20 of them. It came down to one claim. And as long as you get one in, the rest go. Got it. But it, it was, and I, I, I gotta say, don't use LegalZoom. Stay away from that. <laughs> if you're gonna get patented, go shell out the big bucks. Go find some. Uh, be careful because this yeah. is gonna be loaded up on our YouTube channel. They no, may come I, after I, you. I mean, honestly, but, it's, uh, I mean, I understand. There's a shortcut, at. and then there's, there's a, there's a, a shortcut way to do it, and then there's a quality, quality way to right. do it. And I mean, if you want to go do that route, fine, go for it. But when you're uh, dealing with quality, yeah, everything is about you know preserving the uh, intellectual property because it's got to be solid. It does. If, you're, if you ever have to litigate, God forbid you don't. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, and it's just building it out and being a patent. It's one of those where you see it building. Any, anybody who's had kids or something like that, you see them growing. Same thing with a product. You see it building and it doesn't look how you think it would, but it still holds the core values that you had with it before. I'm going to turn that off real okay, quick. No problem. <laughs> you are a classic example of the bootstrap. I mean, so given everything you've been through, uh, I think you've described this as a six or seven year odyssey. Yeah. Where do you see yourself in the next 12 to 24 to 36 months, given that you now have a finished product, the belt line, again, as we go, now that we're in the fall of 2016, 2017 is probably going to be a breakout year for you mm -hmm. as it relates to your ability to knock on wood for that. Uh, be right? great. <laughs> but I mean, even uh, even the you know the general manager of the hotel, I mean, he he expressed some interest. Uh, so again, where do you see yourself? I mean, where do you see your product life cycle yeah, now that you have a finished prototype and are ready to go? I see it hopefully being adopted soon. Um, and then being able to uh, start ramping up production. I mean, with the way we've set everything out, it's gonna be, it's still gonna be evolving, but it's not, the basic design is gonna be the same. It's just maybe skinnier here, maybe a little lower here, or tweaked up here, or something like that. But it's gonna stay basically the same, and hopefully in the next in six to 12 months, I can move out of my parents' house, that'd be awesome. <laughs> when I said, when he, he looted the bootstrapped, we've done all of this on $65,000, okay. wow. the entire thing. I had a very nice friends and family. Um, we're able to, uh, the first four years was really $50,000 and I've only recently been, I'd gone back to them to ask for more. 
Um, you did a couple of GoFund. I mean, you did a couple of uh, crowdfunding. Yeah, we, we did. Uh, we did an Indiegogo crowdfunding, and we found we learned from that. It wasn't exactly the most successful. We did get some money from it, but um, we learned like the audience was saying, "Well, where's the public? Well, I want to see people using it. What's going on there?" And so I was like, "Okay, well, that's what we got to do. From now to the future, we have to get everything tied up to a nice bow." We can get this out in the public and people can use it. Doing that, we found out that it's intu the design is intuitive to children. Okay. Uh, there was one little girl just walked up. We had a bike in the rack, one bike in one of the slots. She just walks up, grabs a little kid bike, grabs, pulls down the arm, pushes her bike in. Her mom walks over. What are you doing, honey? She goes, Mom, I'm parking my bike. Come on. <laughs> and how we were, just, we were scrambling for cameras. Quick, quick, you know. Right. Did anybody get that on video? And we're like, oh, no. But it, it's one of those where we... It, it amazes us the things that come out of this, that the, we put it out in the public and the public's reacted and saying that they love it. Uh, not, not my words, I mean, I love it, but they're saying they love it, you know, and they were saying, well, would you mind paying to park, you know, for it to help out the local economy and everything? And they're saying, well, like, how much? We said two bucks a park. We just throw a number out there. They're like, yeah, no, we could totally do that. And I'm like, that's great, you know, but it's one of those where, you have to interact with the public. You have to interact with other people and then test up, down, which way is it gonna go to see what the market's willing to yield. And once you can do that and find out what the market's willing to yield, you can move forward on that process. And that's one of the things we've done consistently, iteratively as we've been building this out is, what's the market gonna accept for this? How can we develop it further out? And when it comes down to bootstrapped, I've, I've got a bow tied up around my head with my bootstraps. It's... <laughs> so now what's next for you? Are you uh, I, was, I got a two-part question. Have you spoken to Venture and have, how receptive are they to an idea like yours? And as you continue to evolve, how do you, now that you've gotten this part out, you, now yeah. the, building a company is the other part of being an entrepreneur yeah. that people don't necessarily, that there's really no rule book. Even being an MBA doesn't prepare no, you for no, God. building a company. So you ask a room, you ask a room for entrepreneurs, which ones have an MBA, I guarantee you half the room's gonna raise their hand. It doesn't matter. Um, but as far as like venture, getting funding, stuff like that, you know, because a lot of entrepreneurs go out for getting funding. We even we are knocking down doors anywhere we can to get funding. And we say hardware. And people go, we got the cringe back, especially in Atlanta here. Atlanta is very much software oriented, very much app oriented, you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. But then we say, well, we have the hardware done. And I talked to a, uh, an, a nationally known accelerator. And they said, oh, well, we read your resume and we just don't do hardware. And I said, did you read the part where we said we have the hardware done and we just need the software help? Okay. And they're like, oh. So it's a matter of not only do you have to gear your stuff to the public, the what market you're going to sell it to, you got to... For the finance part. For the finance part, too. Right. And I, I got to say, a lot of, most investors will only invest in stuff they're familiar with. And so you're like, okay, how do I get my product to a point that is familiar to investors. And when you have a very new product that no one's ever seen before, it's extremely difficult. So you try to gear it to say, okay, we're gonna sell this. We're gonna set up all the different types of ways that so that as a business, as a startup, we get money from this because I wanna move out of my parents' house. So, <laughs> and, but at the same time, you gotta make money for the community right. and you gotta make money back for the investor as well. And yeah. you gotta make money for the person you're selling it to. So the best one example I know is a guy at Redbox. They said, we're gonna sell it. They had a hard time. They teamed up with Kroger right. saying, I'm gonna go rent a movie. Oh wait, didn't I pick up that baby food? Right. Next thing you know, they're going into Kroger and they're buying stuff from Kroger. And then the next thing you know, it Verizon is, is buying Redbox. Exactly, <laughs> and the next thing you know, Redbox is blowing up across the nation because not only did they do for make money for themselves, they did it for the customer and for everybody else involved. Right. So it's really that community you got to build up. So you bring up an interesting example. So are you thinking of licensing your product or would you work with a distributor? Or how does that work? Or is that something you've even put some thought into? We have put thought into it. At first, we're going to do sales just because we need the cash at yeah. this point. Um, but definitely licensing down the road, um, especially the overseas markets, yes. which are so much larger than they are here. For my success. Oh. Ridiculous, um, but yeah, licensing, uh, even getting down to uh, franchising as well, because if you got these in different uh, cities across the na nation and everything, I can't be at every single one of them. So, and owner operator agreements and everything okay. like that. Um, my dad, who's the uh, head of sales, he, he wants the, uh, the UC campuses. 
right. all of those uh, type campuses and stuff like that. He really wants to get out to those. And um, it's, it's just a matter of getting the word out. I mean, thank you for things like Startup Grind here and everything. Oh, wow. Thank you, Michael, for having me out and everything because this is what a startup needs to be able to get the word out about what they're doing because otherwise we're just sitting in a garage sweating in the sort of Georgia heat, uh, even though we do have a fan on us the whole time. And <laughs> it's like hot air. Praying to God we don't get eaten by uh, mosquitoes too much. <laughs> so now, uh, that being said, I mean, so we're, you've worked with several accelerators. Could I get some feedback from you about that experience? I mean, because there's a lot of them out here. Yeah. You've been through that path. What, 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 is your, what are your thoughts about that? You've there's, there's different types of accelerators. Mm -hmm. There's the educational accelerator. That's right. incubator accelerator. They, it's an educational type system, which is great, for, especially when you're just starting out. Right. Um, but if you, if you don't, some of them end up with like a pitch competition. Yeah, there's, there, there's, the, there's the fast track accelerator, which is like you're already further along and you see that accelerator coming down and you're like, okay, we're gonna sign up, we're gonna go do that. And it's actually just for a short period of time and you end up pitching afterwards. And it's really about gearing, those accelerators tend to be gearing towards whatever investors they're bringing in. Right. Which is great if you're further along down the line. And then there's unique accelerators. Like they are only in one type of industry. Yes. And it's great as an entrepreneur if you can hit multiples of those, being that your product or idea or service can hit those different avenues. Mm -hmm. But at the same point in time, it's you get to a point where you have to choose. You can't go to all the events. You can't do all the accelerators due to financial reasons or whatever. And you gotta really pick and choose what you're gonna do. And that's when tough decisions come down. Right. I could go do that social function. I could go do that fireside chat. I could go do that parade route. You know, what's gonna be beneficial to my startup to progress it further? And I see a lot of burnout lot of burnout and it's one of those where you have to find something inside of you to keep that moving along. So now that you've gotten your product together, are you going to re-engage with that marketplace or do you think you've gotten the value that an accelerator experience can provide for you? Some yes and no. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, there are a few of them that we will not touch with a 10 foot pole just because it didn't quite work out favorably, not really just for us, but we didn't think it was favorably for the general whole. Like okay. they, were, they were still stumbling, stumbling through some stuff. Um, if they turn things around, maybe. Others we hit consistently. And it's one of those where we didn't get in this year. We'll try again to see if we get in next year. Maybe it was, maybe they just, we weren't further along for them to accept us in. And it's also, what are the costs for some of these? If it's somewhere, all I gotta do is write up a thing or do a thing online and submit it, heck yeah. And just throw the name in the hat because my, my <laughs> throw the name in the hat. My first pitch to uh, serial entrepreneurs was to Damon John from Shark Tank. And it was all because I went to his pitch event and I literally took my business card and threw it into the bucket when I walked in. And at the end of the pitch, they pulled out three names of the bucket. Mine was one of them. I went up on stage. I got pulled last. First person grabbed the mic. I'm not ready. Put it in the second person. Second person. I'm not ready. Hand it to me. Okay. You know, I, I <laughs> right. I'm supposed to, oh, okay, sure. And I'm like, they're like, you have three minutes. And I'm thinking, I've never pitched three minutes in my life. I have no idea. All right, screw it. Let's just go ahead and do it. Screw it and do it. Just get it done and go with it. And at the end of it, I got the response of, you know, you're early. And I'm like, yeah, I just started doing this. So okay. cool. very early. And they're like, what's well, not bad. And for me, that was like validation right there. It's like, okay. I didn't get chewed apart because I've been watching them chew people apart the entire competition. Didn't get chewed apart. No negative comments. I was like, Great, I'm gonna move forward with this. Okay. And it's, it's things like that, you know, you just, you never know what's gonna come along, but you have to be aware of what's happening. And if you have a situation, like I said, throw a name in a hat, just do it. And you, you, can, you can always back out of it. If, you, if it's a situation where you just figure out it's not working, you can back out of it. You can go, you can just say, listen, this isn't gonna work for me but you know, just but don't disappear. 
you know, always be honest with where you are and what you're doing. Right. And that honesty will translate over to other people. And I had one guy said that he wanted 3,000 units or something like that. And that was two years ago. I was like, great. And he's like, yeah, they'll be fully functioning and working and everything right when I order them and they get them in the thing. And I'm like, uh, no. And he's like, well, really? You, you sound like you got it all together there. And I'm like, it may sound like that, but this is what's happening. This is where we are. And he's like, now, when we get done, when we get to that point, can I come back and talk to you? And that's when he was like, you know what? You're honest with me up front. You tell me where you are. Sure. When you get to a point, come back and talk with me. And we're in talks with him now again. So we'll see what happens there, you know. Exactly. Well, you know, I really do appreciate this conversation. Um, I w I'd like to maybe have you summarize. We've talked about your experience. Are there any things about what you went through things that you learn from. Because again, part of what Startup Grind is about is not the really shiny, you know, I mean, because again, this is really the flavor of the month. Startup is now getting a lot of energy, yeah. but there's an there's a ugly side to it. And it sounds like you've been through several different approaches to this whole thing. What are some of the things you learned or some of the things that you wouldn't, in hindsight, that you wouldn't do? Um, some things that I wouldn't do would uh, pay up front for an accelerator. Don't do that. Okay. Yeah, I, I made that mistake once. Okay. Never again. Um, learn, learn from everybody. Learn from the experienced entrepreneur. Learn from the new entrepreneur. Because there's all types of information out there. And if you try to learn from experienced entrepreneurs all the time, you're missing out on an entirely different viewpoint. And I, there have been a lot of new entrepreneurs that have surprised the heck out of me. And some made it, some haven't made it. Um, some are just still struggling along and some are still, as I, I like to say right now, things are slow but busy, which is a really weird, I never thought I'd say something like that, but things are happening, but they're slow. Um, and even any opportunity that she, comes down the pipeline Give it some due diligence. See what's going on there. It right. could work out, it could not work out, but at least look at it and see what's up. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's really just about being aware, being honest, and having that drive inside of you that whatever is going on, and you gotta have your own fortitude to keep going with it, but at the same point in time, you still have to check yourself to make sure that this is gonna do something. Right. And be that's realistic. yeah. Be really realistic. Involve other people that you're going to talk to. See, get listen. Okay. You got to listen to other people. Well, you've been very open with us, and you know, again, I think that you're going to get where you're trying to go because again, you've really learned along the way. I I see your product. I I, I listen to your your the evolution of your product. I mean, again, we've talked about a couple of things that hopefully Startup Brian can help you along the way. Uh, one more question around, I know you have the engineering and the MBA. What about, and you said your dad is a pure sales guy from a business development standpoint. Yeah. Are there any things there that you think you might do different? Um, actually, I don't know that I can say that. Okay. Um, my, my dad is experienced in sales and experienced in dealing with selling to people. Um, plus then I, for some, I found out my sister is a graphic designer. She's been helping me out. Her, okay. her, uh, her husband as well is another uh, electrical engineer. He's been helping me out. And it's really that community um, that's been driving. Plus my, you know, mom always wishes you the best for everything you do. So, you know, she loves you no matter what happens. Um, it's really just one of those situations where every, you learn, you gotta learn. Got it. Yeah, if, if there's anything I can say, just you, you got to learn and apply what you learn um, and be open to learning. Great. Um, because otherwise, e even your failure it's could amazing. show you something that's amazing that you pivot around and it's you go for it. But if you don't, if you're not open to that, you'll never see it and you'll you'll crash and burn. Well, I'm actually honored that we had you here because I anticipate big things from you. I'd like to open up the floor now. I mean, I know we've got some folks here to see if there are any questions that they'd like to lob at you as we approach uh, uh, 45 minutes into the hour. So um, do you guys have a few questions, uh, any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, Could you have... introduce yourself as well? 
Uh, hi, my name is Caroline Dunn. Um, my question is, you went over the hardware aspect of your product. How about the RFID software side of it? Uh, how, does, how does that work for a consumer? Yeah, um, there's actually um, electronic stores here in town that you can go and pick up 90% of the electronics that are involved in our, my device. Um, Raspberry. It's all patented, so you're good. No, 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 that's, none of that's patented. That's, okay. the hardware's patented. Yeah, that, that's all just open, that's OEM stuff, that's all over the counter stuff. Um, and it's one of those where we're technology agnostic. So we found out about Raspberry Pis, and I, I've been going on chat rooms and stuff like that. And as long as I make sure that I credit the people who may have come before me and wrote some bit of code that I'm using, which I make sure to do all the time, it's one of those where I reach out to the community to find out how to do stuff. Um, the program that I'm using right now is something I found through a chat room of some other thing, but then went back and completely modified it for the situation that I'm using. And it's that technology, the stuff that's in this is cutting edge because it's actually just coming out now. The Raspberry Pi 2 is what we have in there, but it's also, you could use Raspberry Pi Zero, Adrenos. All of that technology is just now coming out, and, but it's great because we're being able to use it in our product. Now, that's great for a short product run, um, maybe 500 units. When you get up to the 1,000 unit range, uh, mass production, that's when you have to go to the board manufacturers, the guys that actually build this stuff out, then contract with those guys to have a separate board made because it's gonna be mass produced. But when you're still trying to figure out what you wanna do, those are the pies, the Adrenos, all that kind of stuff are great for figuring out what you wanted to do, how you wanted to do. So when you do go to that board manufacturer, you're not just like, hey, I, I want you to do some stuff. You know exactly what you want, exactly how you're going to get it, and you can work with them much faster, much quicker. But yeah, no, the, the I mean, Micro Center down the way, it's just you can go down there as a back room, you can pick up 90% of the electronics that we do. Otherwise, um, we ship in uh, across the country from uh, one other electronic that we use, and it's just because we, it was a solution that we found. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so Please. business model. Uh, yeah. Will you ultimately sell this to, you, you mentioned the Beltline, would, could it be retailers that might perhaps buy these and see that as a revenue opportunity for them? Yeah, we're doing it as a, um, it's a platform business model, so we're selling it to the property, and then we set up maintenance and service contracts with the property for that to be able to, they can charge for parking, so like $2 a park, well, through the app it would be like, oh, we grab maybe like a small percentage of it, the rest of it goes back to the property. So you'll, you'll even provide uh, payment processing? Yeah, payment processing and everything like that, and it's because that way they can charge for parking if they want to, but also we found out that <laughs> cyclists, people who ride around on bicycles a lot, spend about $250 a month on the surrounding community. But they don't ride as much around here because they don't, can't lock up their $1,000 bikes safely. And so. they go to Lebanon's on Sunday, riding through Atlanta, yeah. I think we spoke about that earlier. Yeah. Uh, we were going to go into a store. Mm -hmm. and guess what? Someone had to stay out and watch the bikes. Yeah. That yes. was me. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline and her husband, <laughs> my wife and I, and their cousin. Yeah. We all had to figure out who gets to go in and, and watch the bikes. And one had, it, you showed, they had a, a, a simple uh, bike lock. And we all thought, no, I don't know if that's going to work. Exactly. Right. And so having had a place that we could park it, we'd feel comfortable go in. Yeah, and that's the other thing is like with these locations, with these racks, we can do advertising in the app and advertising in the on the rack itself. But the idea is to push the of uh, push the access for the brick and mortar past its walls. So we can even get uh, being technology agnostic and further down iterations, uh, active Wi-Fi hotspots. Stuff yeah, like you, uh, you. I saw that in some of your material. I mean, the sponsorship piece is really exciting, and I'm just going to toss this out for the paid parking mark, general parking, these guys, this is a nice uplift yeah. for them. Yeah. So, you know, if you already got a parking lot down the middle of downtown. So mm -hmm. linear parking. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you need this to complement. Yes, it is a complement to right. the and parking. Right. Apartment complexes as well can offer it as a service to their tenants. Correct. I've talked to some recently, they just have a room in the back that they put the bikes in. And that's like, well, wouldn't it be nice if you secured them? And they're like, oh yeah, that, that'd be a good idea. Um, and passive revenue stream as well. Passive resident revenue stream for them as well. The whole community gets uplifted, uh, and it's it, we build it out so as uh, so a subscription even for the cyclist. The cyclist like, oh great, you know, I'm paying to, I'm paying you know two bucks a park, you know, 
what do I get? I get the security out of it. That's great. But you know, I got to use my app every time. It's like, oh, great. Well, you sign up with a subscription with us. We'll give you a key card. No more app. That's why you just take out your billfold and just tap it. And it, that way the system will lock up. And now on the online platform, you get access to whatever deals are in the area, you know, that maybe the person going and parking their car wouldn't be able to. Right. Digital coupons. As a matter of fact, in some of your material that's online, you talk about signage that, uh, that can be leveraged uh, on the device itself yeah. and on several parts of it and for at different tiers and I get, you don't talk about that but that I think it's also oh, yes. a very exciting opportunity for um, you know um, you know for the cyclists and for the people who come to a business and having yeah. it be right out there it's like a billboard the, the idea is that we wanted to get like outside of Pond City Market so the minute you go in and park your bike you can pull your app out click it and it's like oh here's the deals that are happening in Pond City Market right. or whatever shopping complex it is um, and it's a way for, to facilitate you, the cyclist, to make your experience better, but it's also to help the community so that they can ensure that security in their patrons to come out and use their area, their businesses, but also to build the community up as a whole and also to get, once again, get me moved out of my parents' house. <laughs> it's um, imperative. Like, bootstrapped is a key thing in that because, yeah, it's... Yeah, oh, man. <laughs> I love them to death, but it's... I, I think with your enthusiasm, you're going to get to your goal. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the audience, from the other entrepreneurs out here? Okay, well, listen, thank you again, uh, Ted. I mean, again, thank good you. luck to you. you. I appreciate you coming out tonight. And, uh, you know, again, much. Um, I give you all the goodwill that I can, any other resources that Startup Grind can bring to the table. I appreciate you taking your time out tonight, and I'm sure you'll do well. Thank you. All thank right. you for having me on here. No problem. Thanks.